For years now, we've been hearing about how six core CPUs should no longer be purchased for gaming. They're just not future proof or you know, something to that effect. And even in the more extreme examples, we've heard that eight core CPUs for gaming is no longer a sound investment. Rather, 12 or 16 core models, they will do a much better job of seeing you off into the future. So today, we're going to revisit the old classic six versus eight core battle with one of the most demanding scenarios possible, Battlefield 6 Conquest Multiplayer. And the results may surprise you. But before we get to that, Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by ASUS Store and their new Locker Store 6 Gen 3 AS 6806T. Packing a quad-core AMD Ryzen CPU with 16GB of DDR5 4800ECC memory. It offers easy backups to numerous devices and cloud services. Included is dual 10 gigabit ethernet, which can be combined in SMB multi-channel for up to twice the bandwidth. And in addition to that, there's also five gigabit ethernet along with two USB 4 ports. As for the software, you're not locked down as ASUS Tor NAS devices do not restrict installing third-party operating systems. And the latest version of ASUS Tor Data Manager packs all the features you could possibly need, including iSCSI. We've populated ours with Seagate's IronWolf 20 terabyte drives, and with the health management software, we can ensure the drives are running optimally. There's also four M.2 slots supporting PCIe 4.0 for ultra fast storage. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. Okay, so I've been tackling the misconception that many gamers seem to have about CPUs and core count for years now. And despite my best efforts, I'm still seeing many of the same comments surrounding the release of Battlefield 6 or at least, you know, the open beta. For example, Battlefield 6 can heavily utilize 16 core processors, meaning it allows for parallel processing, splitting up the workload into smaller independent tasks or subtasks, so that multiple cores can work simultaneously. What this means is if you have a 16 core processor, the game will do a good job of spreading the load across all 16 cores. But what this doesn't mean is that the game requires 16 cores, or that a 16 core processor will necessarily be faster than a 6 core processor, for example. It's merely good news for higher core count CPUs, as it means you'll be getting better performance out of these individual CPUs than you would have if the game, say, utilized 6 or 8 cores. Now, if, for example, the game 100% utilized a 16 core Ryzen 9 5950X, as in all cores maxed out, and this resulted in an average frame rate of just over 100 FPS, then it stands to reason that 8-core and in particular 6-core Ryzen processors of the same generation would really struggle, likely limiting performance to well below 100 FPS, and possibly even suffering from poor frame time performance plagued by stuff like stuttering. But if the game was to spread the load across all 16 of the 5950X's cores, but only saw an overall CPU utilization of, say, 50%, then it means an 8-core processor should still work well, and possibly even a 6-core model of the same generation. And this is more what we're seeing from Battlefield 6. So then, Battlefield 6 can utilize 16 cores, but it certainly doesn't require 16 cores. If you were to use an older 12 or 16 core processor, the game would run much better than if the core utilization was limited to just 6 or 8 cores. Therefore, as is always the case, at least within reason, a certain number of cores isn't required. It's more about the overall CPU performance than it is individual core count. There are certainly six core CPUs that will deliver better performance than even the 5950X in Battlefield 6, such as the Ryzen 5 7600X, and this is because the individual cores of the Zen 4 processor are much faster than the Zen 3 cores of the 5950X. Now, when talking about CPUs of the same generation, adding more cores can certainly be of benefit, especially when there's no latency penalty associated with adding those extra cores. For example, in a CPU demanding game like Battlefield 6, I would always expect the 5800X to be faster than the 5600X, as both CPUs use a single CCD, but I wouldn't necessarily expect the 5900X to be faster than a 5600X. And this is due to the latency penalty incurred when communicating between CCDs. So the architectural design also plays a role in this core count discussion, but that's an added layer of complexity that we won't delve into for this content. The point is, the 5800X is likely to be faster than the 5600X, given there's 33% more cores, but I wouldn't expect it to be 33% faster, as the cores won't be fully utilized, and there will still be some reliance on the primary thread that will cause a processing bottleneck. 
But rather than theorize about this, we might as well just take a look. So for testing the same method as previous Battlefield 6 videos, that means I'll be benchmarking the processor simultaneously, so the benchmark passes were recorded in the same match at the same time, with both systems doing very much the same thing. Once again for the graphics card, both systems are of course fitted with a GeForce RTX 5090, and because this is strictly a CPU benchmark, testing takes place at 1080p, but I've also included some 1440p data, but if you're a gamer and you don't understand why we're not going as high as 4K for a CPU test, well we do have a lot of videos explaining just that, so I guess go watch those. And remember when doing so, GPU limited, especially heavily GPU limited, CPU testing is super duper dumb. Super duper TI dumb. And of course this isn't a system benchmark, again it is a CPU benchmark. And therefore this has nothing to do with what resolution you think gamers game at and how that should apply to this CPU testing. Okay, annoying disclaimer once again out of the way, I think we should probably get on with it, so let's go do it. We'll start with the current generation Zen 5 processors. Here we have the 6 core Ryzen 5 9600X alongside the 8 core 9700X, both locked at 5.4 GHz, both using DDR5 6000 CL30 memory, and of course the GeForce RTX 5090. This test at 1080p using the low preset ran for just over 2 minutes, and much of that time was spent in the action. We saw an average utilization of 80 to 85% for the 9600X, and then 60 to 65% for the 9700X. After just over 2 minutes of gameplay, the 9600X averaged 161 FPS, and the 9700X 168 FPS, making the 8 core processor just 4% faster. The 1% lows were even closer. Here the 8 core part was just 2.5% faster, and both displayed excellent frame time performance. So it seems to be the case that those playing Battlefield 6 won't be able to tell the difference between these two processors, despite the 9700X packing 33% more cores. Now, to avoid a small portion of gamers having an aneurysm or some other kind of serious medical emergency, I've included some 1440p results. Because, like, who games at 1080p with an RTX 5090? That is totally unrealistic. Or, you know, whatever. <laughs> so anyway... I'm having too much fun with this, sorry guys. 1440p with the low preset, let's get serious here. Now because these results are still heavily CPU bound, frame rates end up being much the same, and so does the margin between these two processors as the 9700X was just 4% faster on average. That being the case, let's move on to check out the ultra quality preset, again starting with the 1080p resolution data. Now this might surprise some of you, but as is often the case, the higher quality settings don't just stress the GPU, but also the CPU. And despite the frame rates dropping quite considerably, suggesting that we're more likely to run into a GPU bottleneck, the heavier CPU load actually sees a larger separation between the 6 and 8 core processors. By the end of this test, the 9700X is seen to be 9% faster than the 9600X, with a 10% increase to the 1% lows. Not exactly massive margins by any stretch of the imagination, but they are considerably larger than those seen when using the low preset. Jumping up to 1440p with the ultra preset, we find a very similar thing. Here the 9700X ends up delivering 9% greater performance, confirming what we just saw at 1080p. So then, the 8-core Zen 5 processor is up to 10% faster than the 6-core model, not quite in line with the 33% increase in cores or the 50% increase in price, but hey, it is faster. Next up, I thought we would downgrade the core performance with the Zen 3 parts, using the Ryzen 7 5800X and Ryzen 5 5600X. Both locked at 4.7GHz using DDR4 3600CL14 memory. Now, you would expect the margins between the 6 and 8 core processors to widen a bit here, given that we are using weaker cores, or at least that's what I would expect, but we're not really seeing that in this example. And this is because the 5800X was just 5% faster than the 5600X, so again both CPUs delivered virtually identical performance, and even the 1% lows and frame time performance was very similar. And this means gamers won't be able to tell the difference between these two CPUs. Increasing the resolution does favour the 8-core model a little bit more, but even so, by the end of our test, it was just 8% faster on average, with almost no difference seen when comparing 1% lows. Moreover, quite impressively, 
both CPUs delivered excellent frame time performance. It's also worth noting that under these same test conditions, the 6-core Ryzen 5 7600X is almost 40% faster than the 8-core 5800X. So again, this is more evidence that core count really doesn't matter nearly as much as core performance. Now, switching up to the more demanding ultra settings, again at 1080p, we find similar margins between these Zen 3 processors. In fact, the 8-core model is now just 6% faster on average with a mere 4% boost to the 1% lows. Then at 1440p, we're looking at very similar performance between these two CPUs, both averaging around 90 FPS with between 65 to 70 FPS for the 1% lows. So even here, whether you own the 5600X or 5800X, the performance is going to be much the same, and no gamer, even a professional competitive gamer, would be able to tell which one of these CPUs they're actually using. So what about the rickety old Zen Plus bangers? How are those old dinosaurs getting on in Battlefield 6? Honestly, much better than I expected, and interestingly, it's here where we start to see some real differences between these 6 and 8 core models, which is what I was expecting to see with Zen 3, but it looks like we've had to go down to Zen Plus. By the end of this 1080p low preset test, the 2700X was on average 20% faster. That's a substantial performance uplift with 25% stronger 1% lows. Crucially, the 2700X kept the 1% low figure above 60 FPS, whereas the 2600X dropped to just below 50 FPS. So a convincing win here for the 7-year-old 8-core processor. In this next test at 1440p, the 2600X does fare much better and is able to keep the 1% lows above 60 FPS. And as a result, the 2700X was 14% faster when comparing the average frame rate, but this time just 10% faster when looking at those 1% lows. Now increasing the quality preset to Ultra, we see that at 1080p, the 2700X was 15% faster when comparing the average frame rate, and 16% faster when looking at the 1% lows. So it is quite clear now that the margin between these 6 and 8 core processors is larger using these older chips. Then quite interestingly, at 1440p, with the Ultra preset, we're back to a 20% margin in favour of the 2700X, with 16% stronger 1% lows. So it's fair to say that the 2700X is around 10-20% to faster than the 2600X, depending on the load. So there you have it. Generally speaking, the performance gains seen when going from 6 to 8 cores is quite small, and you really do have to go back quite far in time to see margins as large as 20% in favour of the 8 core model. It's also worth noting that upon release, the 2700X cost around 45% more than the 2600X. So even when you consider the up to 20% performance advantage that we're seeing here today, the Ryzen 5 part was still technically much better value. The 2700X was a serious bargain option in late 2019, dropping as low as $200 US, though the Ryzen 5 2600 also bottomed out around $115 US at the same time, making it by far the better value choice for gamers. Having the extra cores with the 2700X certainly was nice, if you could afford them, but there's really no denying that in terms of value, the Ryzen 5 series has delivered the goods over the years. The more cores debate has been a thing for a long time now, certainly a mainstream topic for gamers ever since the release of Ryzen. I remember tackling this subject at least 7 years ago now. Back then, some AMD fans were upset that I was still recommending Intel CPUs for those seeking the very best gaming performance, as I claimed that the Core i7-8700K was the best of the best, which, again, I still believe it was. I think most people would agree that it was. Now, the counter-argument to this, from some viewers, cited the fact that the cheaper 2700X packed 8 cores with 16 threads, and that's 33% more cores than the 8700K, and therefore, they claimed it would age better, eventually delivering superior gaming performance. The problem with this being that the individual cores of the 8700K were just much faster, particularly for gaming, when compared to the Zen Plus-based 2700X. So to try and simulate this alleged future outcome, I got a bit creative and disabled two cores on each processor, creating a 4-core Core i7 versus 6-core Ryzen 7 comparison, as this allowed games at the time to more heavily utilise each of these CPUs, and the end result was the same. The 8700K still came out on top. And then through further investigation, I found that for the Zen Plus architecture to outpace Coffee Lake for gaming, it would require 
100% more cores. And of course, the game would have to be able to utilize 100% of the cores of the Ryzen processor, and this was seen when limiting the 8700K to just two cores, for a comparison with the 2700X using four cores. So even all the way back then, we had demonstrated that cores ain't cores, and therefore games don't necessarily require a certain amount of cores, but rather processing power. Of course, you can get silly with this sort of thing, go to the extreme and point to the fact that there's no quad-core CPUs anymore, and therefore there probably isn't a quad-core CPU that can really play Battlefield 6 well. But to my point, if you could take a processor such as the 9800X 3D and disable half the cores, turning it into a Zen 5 X 3D V-Cache quad-core, it would still be faster than many 6 and 8-core processors released over the past five years. On a similar note, there have been claims made over the years that 8-core processors are better for multitasking. So this means when gaming, you're able to watch a 4K video, chat with teammates on Discord, even stream your gameplay, and receive much better performance with the 8-core processors because it has those extra cores to tackle that additional work. But to my knowledge, despite these claims being quite numerous, the people making them never really had any evidence to point to. So three years ago, I set out to change that with some real-world testing, and in the end, I couldn't find any evidence to support those claims. And if you want to check out that video, it was titled, Does Multitasking Hurt Gaming FPS? Anyway, wrapping this content up, it was very impressive to see that despite being extremely CPU demanding, Battlefield 6 doesn't run like hot garbage on older, slower CPUs. Sure, the frame rate isn't going to be as high, of course, that is to be expected, but the frame time performance was very consistent, and the overall experience on something like a Ryzen 7 2700X is remarkably good. Certainly still very usable, which I have to say it shocked me a bit, but then of course, you know, I'm an out-of-touch YouTuber who only plays games with a 9800X 3D, so perhaps it's really not that surprising after all. And on that note, that is going to do it for this video. If you liked it, you know what to do. Subscribe for more content. We will have a very big Battlefield 6 GPU benchmark and probably CPU benchmark released once the game comes out. So that'll be what's well, probably still a few months away. But anyway, we'll do that when the game comes out. Um, uh, in the meantime, we have the join button or Patreon. Signing up to either one of those will give you access to more Harbour Unbox goodness. We have an exclusive Discord server for members only, monthly live stream for members only, behind the scenes content, Q&A stuff, a lot of cool things there. So check that out if you're interested. But if not, that's perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.